everyone, and welcome to another MCAT Master Interview. For those of you that have been following the series, obviously I am not Sam. So my name is Monica. I'm new to MCAT Mastery. I'm a recent graduate and I actually took the MCAT last year and I'm really excited to be doing my first top score interview. So in these interviews, we basically talk with MCAT top scorers so that we can find out what strategies help them the most in their process and hopefully inspire you as you're studying because we know how tough it can be. And even top scorers have struggled with the MCAT, but they managed to increase their scores to competitive levels. So we want to show you how they did it so that you can do it too. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to Renata Buffalino. Renata, welcome to the series and thanks for joining us. Hi, thank you so much. I really appreciate you guys reaching out and wanting to talk to me. Yeah, we're super excited to hear from you. So just a little background on Renata. Just two weeks left before her test date, she signed up for tutoring with us to hopefully increase past her 503-505 range where she was stuck. And even with such a short amount of time, she was able to lift her score to a whopping 511 in just two weeks. That is so impressive, that's awesome. So congrats on that score, Renata, that is amazing. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so in the interview, we're just gonna dive into understanding exactly like how you achieved that increase, how you studied, how you scheduled your prep, and what strategies you used for each section, and so much more. So uh, lots to come, very exciting, and why don't we get started? So Renata, do you wanna just start out by telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. I actually started like thinking about slash actually studying for the MCAT in January. So my test was in June, and so I was like, okay, I'll give myself a whole semester, basically. But from January to like mid-May, it wasn't like, hardcore studying. It was just very like low key. I actually signed up for one of those in-person Kaplan courses that I had at my undergrad college. And um, it was helpful. I met with that guy like once a week and he would just keep, you know, me and some other students on track with where we were with the MCAT and everything. And then that came with all the Kaplan books and the videos and like the practice quizzes and stuff. So I would definitely recommend that. Some people don't really vibe with Kaplan that much, but I thought it was helpful. The books are pretty expansive, and um, the stuff online was really helpful to me because sometimes when I didn't understand, like, a specific topic, the videos would really clarify it for me. And then the practice quizzes really urge you to, like, stay on track, and they keep a huge inventory of the subjects you get wrong versus right. So I would yeah, definitely yeah. plug that. And then also, <laughs> I used a lot of flashcards. There's this app you can use on your computer called like Anki, spelled like A-N-K-I, mm -hmm. and you can download like MCAT flashcard decks that are already made online, so totally free. So I used that also. And so for the most part, like for January to May, I was just doing that course once a week and like just trying to keep up with it and then doing flashcards. And then at the halfway point when I graduated in May and then the rest of June that I had before my test date, I just hit the pavement like super hard. Yeah. So I guess my advice would be switch it up. Like, don't just use one thing. Like, whenever I got bored of reading, I would switch to flashcards. And then when I got bored of flashcards, I would switch to videos. And then I would go back to reading. And like, you can't just stay with one thing because studying one thing or like studying one group of things for four months is insane. Like, you will want to like smash your head into the wall. Yeah, definitely yeah. finding diversity in like what you're doing so that you can stay interested like yeah. in the content and everything it just demands so much attention <laughs> yeah and you can lose that attention if you're not you know keeping yourself interested so I yeah. totally get that so tell us about your undergrad too like did you know you wanted to be pre-med like from the get-go and all that? oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> I knew I wanted to be pre-med since high school it's always <laughs> been like a one-track mind I actually I was a neuroscience major so I took a lot of specialized neuroscience classes, and also this is important, I took a lot of psychology classes, which is why my psych score was, mm -hmm. I mean, so good. Like, I'll, I'll, t I'll talk about strategies I did for that, but let's not forget, <laughs> I took a lot of psych courses. So I've always struggled with um, math and like advanced chemistry and stuff. I mean, who doesn't struggle with organic chemistry? So right. I mean, that's not like that huge. But I mean, even basic math and physics was like never super strong for me. So that's why my chem and phys section was not surprising to me. <laughs> yeah. But other than that, um, you know, I was involved in stuff. 
I did like community service and uh, clubs and stuff like that. So it was fun. I liked my college career. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I was going to ask you about that. Like, did you take a lot of psych classes? Like what was going on there? So that's super interesting that your major definitely contributed to the the score that you saw in psych, which was an amazing score. <laughs> so that's awesome. So you were studying from January to May a little bit while you were still in undergrad. So we were talking about undergrad a little bit, and you said that you knew you wanted to be pre-med from since high school. So what made you, I guess, want to go on the path to become a doctor to begin with? Well, my dad works as a chiropractor. Um, I actually went to high school and grew up in Bozeman, Montana. So my dad was like, you know, I mean, we lived in Bozeman for a while, but we also lived in like Wilsall and Livingston. And like, there's a lot of like smaller places, you know, in rural Montana. And so it was cool. You know, I shadowed my dad um, a lot and I would just see him like run around and, you know, do a lot of healthcare related stuff. And that was a big contributor to why I wanted to go into medicine. Also, you know, as I started to take like, you know, those silly like biomed classes in high school that are like kind of like driven towards that, like I really like the body systems and I fell in love with the brain, especially like I love all that psych stuff and the neuro stuff. I actually wanted to go to the college I picked because they offered a neuroscience major. That was one of the main attractions to me. I've always just been super interested in like how the body works and how it does its thing, you know? Yeah, and so then you're kind of passionate about the content, too, like, when you're learning the MCAT content. Yeah, it is really good. If you can find a way to get really excited about it and be like, wow, I didn't know all this stuff, and I'm learning all of it, there is some of it that you're like, this does not seem important, (laughs) and you're going to find that, but a lot of it, like, especially the bio stuff, and to me, the psych stuff, it's just it's amazing how much you realize you don't know, even after, you know, mm-hmm. four or three years of college. Yeah, definitely. And I also think that the MCAT is interesting in that way because of the passages. So like you're reading mm-hmm. these passages and it gives you like kind of real world applications of these things, like, for example, that you're learning in psych, which can make the MCAT kind of interesting. Like, Right. It's like not good enough that you just know the fact, like they're going to interweave it with seven other topics that you might have looked at like earlier or something else and you have to piece it all together it's kind of cool yeah it's like a puzzle almost a very challenging i wouldn't go so far to call the mcat cool because you know we're not friends but (laughs) (laughs) i guess the the information is cool it's a professional relationship rather than a friendship (laughs) exactly um but your acquaintances you're not enemies which is the important thing exactly yeah So um, you started studying for the MCAT in January. Do you want to just like talk about, you know, everything that happened in March, the coronavirus, like how all of that kind of affected? Sure. Um, So just like everyone else, it was surprising. Right. Um, It kind of came out of nowhere. And it really sucked for me um, because I was a senior at the time. So, you know, I was living in an apartment with my friends and we all had to go home. And they told us the graduation was canceled and everything. Mm -hmm. And like, I got my diploma in the mail and it just, you know, it hurts, you know, having four years of hard work under your belt. And then, I mean, obviously there were bigger things going on at the time. So I'm not trying to like say, oh, this is the biggest tragedy, but it just, it did suck. It's just a memory that I, you know, now don't have that a lot of people have of like graduation. And then also I have a lot of family members in New York. So a lot of them actually did get sick. And they, thankfully, they've made full recoveries um, since then. But when the disaster was going on in New York, it was very stressful uh, worrying about them Mm -hmm. and stuff. Also, I have, you know, all four grandparents in their old. So that was also scary for a while there. So anyway, just having all that panic and fear Mm -hmm. and just not knowing what's going to happen going on did not help in studying. Mm -hmm. (laughs) If anything, it I mean, it was good to have a distraction, I guess, though. So it was good to distract myself with the MCAT work and just try not to think about it. And I was really lucky because my MCAT didn't get pushed to another date because I know a lot of people had their MCATs canceled and pushed and they had to reschedule and everything. My MCAT stayed the same. It was actually the cutoff 
of the last wow. and scheduled MCAT dates that didn't get moved. So I was like, oh my gosh, thank God, you know. But my time did get moved. So instead of going in at 8, I now had to go in at 6.30. So, you know, that had to change how I did my practice tests. I had to change yeah. how I studied. I started studying earlier in the morning. I took my practice tests at 6.30. Wow. Which was not fun. And I did practice tests with the mask on. You know, it was just a lot of adjusting to what it was now. Yeah, that's really smart to, like take the test with the mask on and kind of mimic the actual situation. Yeah, I definitely did not want to be on real test day, like itching my face because of the mask I didn't prepare for. <laughs> right. No, that's definitely a good call. So did you take the shortened exam then? or I did. Yeah, I took okay. like the five hour one, I think, Yeah, which was another point of stress because all my practice tests up until right. then had been the seven hour. And then at the last, like the last week, before I took my MCAT, Kaplan just released a new like five yeah. hour practice test. So I only took one shortened practice before my real test. Wow, that is kind of stressful. So yeah. <laughs> how did you work on the timing then? Did you just take the seven hour one and kind of say, mm -hmm. oh, if I can do seven hours, like. Because you get the same amount of time per question. Mm -hmm. So practice is practice is practice. To me, I just saw it as I'm just going to have more to like, you know, look at. And I've heard from other people in the past that the shortened one was easier to manage time. So, but, I mean, mm -hmm. I wasn't gonna take others word for it, but I just figured <laughs> if I had practiced answering questions in the time that they needed for the, to complete the seven hour one, then it would fall into place for the five hour. But it, I think that if you're given more five hour practice test and you're gonna take the five hour test, then definitely do the shortened practice. I just didn't have the option at the time because it was also new. Yeah, but you adjusted, so, and it went well, so that's good. Yeah, I think actually the shortened test was better in a way mm -hmm. because I didn't get so tired. Like you, by the end of the seven hour one, you are just ready to submit. You don't even care what the score <laughs> is anymore. You you just want to go to bed, you know? Right. The five hour, by the end of it, you're at least still like, oh, like, I'll go back and check my answers, <laughs> you know? Right. And maybe since you took those seven hour tests in the beginning, you built up like this endurance. Stamina, and could... yeah. Right. So... I was definitely more grateful for the short one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's still five hours. So it's. Yeah, not, I mean, it's not like. Know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. Shortened exam. That's definitely different. So we want to hear anything you have to say about that because I know a lot of people have been stressed about it. I think the one thing that it kind of bit it kind of like didn't help was cars, um, okay. which I know that's not what people want to hear, but you know, all the other sections were fine. They were paced well. I didn't really notice a difference from the seven hour, but cars is harder because there is shorter time. They do put less passages in there for you, but mm -hmm. you still have to read fast and you need to be ready right. to like think on the fly. Yeah, no, that's fair. And thank you for saying that. Like, a lot of people aren't sure what the exam is going to be like, and I know cars is difficult to pace to begin with. Mm -hmm. So knowing that maybe you do need to read, you still need to read fast and maybe even read faster. Mm -hmm. So just keeping that in mind for cars in the future. I would definitely recommend testing with the mask though. And at the time that you're going to take the real test, because I know some people mm -hmm. now have like late times, like I think it's like 6 p.m., Definitely right. take your practice test when you're going to take the real test. Like, be as close as possible. Yeah. Yeah, because you, you know, 6 p.m., you could be hungry or something or, mm -hmm. like, tired. So you want to make sure you're mimicking those. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. awesome advice. I personally can't eat very much that early in the morning or I'll get mm -hmm. sick. So I had to try multiple different foods to eat that early in the morning <laughs> to see what wouldn't make me sick but would also keep me, like, focused yeah, and, like, can I have coffee or not? Like, mm -hmm. all these different things that you need to be thinking about that are smaller things, but strategy-wise. Exactly. Yeah, so um, that being said, when you started your MCAT prep before all of this, like, you knew you were going to be taking it in June. Um, what was your score goal, and, like, how did you come up with that? So my score goal took kind of a roller coaster type of uh, dip halfway through. Mm -hmm. Like everyone taking this test, you start to think, oh wow, I don't know why I thought I could get that. I have to compromise. 
And that's just a horrible thing that the test makes you think because that comes after so much self-doubt and Mm -hmm. seeing bad scores and thinking, I don't know who I think I am because this is not going well. So my Mm -hmm. original score goal was a 512 because my med school advisor um, at college and a lot of other websites and resources I looked at said that 512 was competitive. And my stupid child brain was like, oh, that should be fine. I can get 512, no problem. Mm -hmm. It won't even be an issue. And my baseline diagnostic was a 493. And I thought, that's fine. You know, that's without any practicing. I'll just slowly bring that up. But as I did practice tests and practice tests and practice tests, um, I started to realize, I started to compromise with myself. I was like, okay, maybe not a 512, maybe a 510. 510's my new, my new score goal because I could not get above a 505, which was so infuriating because you watch a steady climb of your score and then you just get stopped and you're not doing anything different. If anything, you're, you're still reviewing and you're going harder than before and it's just not changing. So that's that moment is when I reached out to MCAT Mastery because I was like, clearly I need to do something else, you know? Right. So what do you think, like, was keeping you at that 505? Like, what do you think your biggest challenge was? I personally think, so all my other scores were in a decent range and they kept increasing, except chem and phys. Mm -hmm. Like, my bio was fine. I mean, it wasn't great, but it was fine. My cars and psych just kept increasing because, mm-hmm. I mean, the more you practice those, the better they get, in my opinion. But chem and phys, it, it just felt like each practice test, there was something I didn't know. And that was just crushing my score constantly. Also, I totally forgot about this until I answered some of your guys' survey questions the other day. But on my diagnostic, my chem and phys, like, beginner's percentile was seventh percentile. That's like... that. That's single digits. It's insane now looking back on it. Mm -hmm. And even after a whole semester of just constantly working on it, I was only in like the 30th and 40th percentile. And so, you know, when you have a bunch of others that are like 60th, 70th, and then one section is 30th or 40th, it just drags the whole score down. Yeah. Like, I probably would have been, my score probably would have been increasing if my chem and phys section wasn't just, you know, a weight. It was horrible. Yeah. Yeah. And a a part, part of that wasn't only just because of the content. Like I was pounding those equations into my head, but a lot of it was, you know, my mental state was, oh, I'm bad at this. And so that Mm -hmm. just makes it come true. It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I think one of the greatest things that my tutor did for me was just really pinpoint why I had this mental hang up and why I think I'm so bad at it and like how I can change my studying strategies to be more confident. Yeah, definitely. That's a huge thing for the MCAT, I feel like, because like you said, like it's really easy to get disheartened by your scores, especially when you're stagnant or, you know, decreasing (laughs) when you've been studying for so long. And it doesn't have to do so much with content as it does with like maybe strategy or just your mindset and what you think, like you said, a self-fulfilling prophecy, neuroscience major stuff. So do you want to expand a little bit more on, I guess, how your mindset was when you started and like how it changed and what Tim, I guess, told you to help you change it? Yeah, sure. So I was at a breaking point because I, like many other people who could, you know, consider themselves like, you know, you do good in college, you know, you think, oh, I know how to take a test because Mm -hmm. after four years of pain, you at least can say that, right? And so the fact that I was doing the maximum amount of work I could and still not seeing results, it, it messes with you. It does. Because you think this doesn't happen to me. Like I've had all this time, I've had all these resources and it's not getting better. So there must be like a fundamental problem. Yeah. And it's so funny because I remember our first tutoring session, Tim looked at me and he's like, I can already tell what your problem is. <laughs> he's like, you stress so much about the chem and phys section that not only is it lowering your score obviously in the section, but then the rest of the test, cause you know, chem and phys is first, the right. rest of the test you're stuck in that I suck mindset. And that is a horrible mindset to go into the MCAT with because then every time you're like, oh, I'm stuck between these two answers, you spiral. 
because you're like, how can I not know this immediately? Right. And it's terrible. So he suggested that instead of, you know, because I already, I did know most of the equations. Like, I knew the stuff. But every time I'd read the passage, I couldn't figure out when to use it. Mm -hmm. And so he taught me, you know, instead of reading the passage thinking, I don't understand this, read it and try to figure out like, okay, if I had to narrow this down, what basic topic are they asking about? Because then once you narrow down what basic topic they're asking about, then you can find the equation in your head that goes Mm -hmm. with the topic. And then it just kind of falls into place from there. So I think that the big issue a lot of people have is they think, oh, I don't know the content. And it's like, well, you, you might know the content. It might all be there. But if you can't access it in context of the passage, then it's like you don't even know it at all. Yeah. yeah. And also, you know, he told me to like really focus on my breathing and just trying to calm down on the actual test because each moment you think about time, like, oh, I'm running out of time, or, oh, I'm taking too much time on this problem, like, that's not constructive thinking, and it's almost as bad as, like, straight up getting distracted on test day. Yeah, getting into your own head is so, like, distracting and Mm -hmm. detrimental, especially when you're trying to, like, like you said, read a passage and take away, like, main points from it. So what would you say to somebody? Like, did you use mantras kind of to keep yourself on track or mindfulness techniques? Like, what is your advice to, like, stay calm? Well, I would like to start off by saying that I was never the meditation person. Mm -hmm. Like, not ever. I was that person who was like, that's for other people. I think it's, you know, whatever. And so (laughs) I was never into that. But This is how stressful the MCAT was for me. I was ready to try anything because I, like, I couldn't sleep at night. I couldn't eat. It was, it was getting terrible. I have raging stress about certain things and this was really eating me alive. So Tim was like, hey, you know, maybe try meditation. And I was like, yeah, sure. Because (laughs) I was just ready for anything. I'm so surprised to say that like even 10 minutes a day, like before I started my study sessions every day, I would just sit down. And like, you know, sometimes listen to like a YouTube guided meditation or whatever, or sometimes just sit there in silence, but really just take 10 minutes to be like, okay, you're going to get frustrated. You're going to be stressed out. You're going to see bad, like, you know, on my practice quizzes, you're going to see bad scores and you're going to get stuff wrong, but that's okay because all of that is just leading to the bigger goal. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like a lot of people will say, oh, I don't need to have that talk with myself, but you really do because you don't realize how personally you take all of that stuff, you know, until you actually have a sit down talk with yourself and you're like, look, today we're going to make a promise and we're not going to take this stuff personally and we're just going to move forward. And I think that's really valuable for people if they're just losing their minds to stress. Like, even if you think, oh, I'm not a meditation person, like, just try it. It really was surprising to me. And it didn't work the first time. It worked, Mm -hmm. you know, the fifth time, the sixth time. And it was really nice, honestly, surprisingly. Yeah, I was never a big meditation or, like, mindfulness person until, like, the MCAT, when you just need, like, a second to get all these words out of your brain, you know? And Like, think about it this way. You don't need to train to walk to your car, right? But if you're walking seven miles, you should train yourself to walk stronger, right? And Mm -hmm. so you don't need to train mindfulness for just, like, going about your daily life. But this is a mindfulness test also because it is so stressful to do. So, you know, even just training how to think about it, like, Instead of thinking during the test, oh my gosh, I don't know this, I don't know this, I, this does not look familiar, think there's got to be a clue in this passage about something that I know, because mm-hmm. I'm confident that I know enough to at least see something that seems familiar. And so changing the mindset to that makes you really think like, no, I didn't miss something in my studying, I must know something about this, you know? Yeah, like having confidence in yourself and confidence that like, this was a big thing for me too when I was studying that the answer is in the passage somewhere. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that was a realization that I found like halfway through and and it Mm -hmm. changes from there because you're like, I just need to read it again or I need to like, I know this, you know, it's not so much as I don't know this and I'm terrified, but I do. The minute you start to think this question has nothing to do with the passage you already, you, you know you have to go back, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. 
starting, you talked a little bit about chem and phys already, but just expanding on some of the other sections. So you got a really high score in psych and soc, um, and you said that might be related, I guess, to your background, but is there anything else that you did to study that you think really helped you there? Yeah, so my psych soc score was not that great. I mean, it wasn't even, I mean, my psych soc score started like in the 50th, so it's not like I just came out of school like doing great even your best section does need work Mm -hmm. for sure and for me I would say for psych it's just I mean no one wants to hear this but it's memorization if you memorize every single term and you memorize all of the you know the theories and the people responsible for the theories and all that stuff and then once you have all the base memorization down you need to understand the definitions well enough to know the differences the problem with the psych so section is that there are a lot of definitions that are two words apart. They are so similar, but the terms are different and they mean slightly different things. And that can be the difference between a point and no point. And so for that, I would say I talked about that flashcard app. That helped me tremendously. I mean, I probably did 600 psychology terms in flashcard form. And by the entire semester of doing those flashcards, I was dreaming about them. Like, I can do them so fast. And then if you feel like I I know this, like I memorized it all, what's holding me back, um, what you might need to do is when you take your practice test, there's four answer choices each time. And the MCAT tries to throw in an answer choice that's completely foreign and not in your studying. And the problem with that is you'll go, oh, I can't rule that out because a lot of psych Mm -hmm. is just ruling it out. You say, oh, well, it can't be that. That doesn't make sense. It can't be that. That doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. And if you find one that you're like, I don't know what that means, you start to think, I can't rule it out. So the one that I thought made sense might not. And that self-doubt is what causes issues. So what will really help you is if you look at your practice tests, go through even the answer choices, even if you got it right, go through the answer choices that you don't recognize. And then as you start just adding to that bank of knowledge, you'll see every answer choice and be like, three of these don't make sense. One of them does. That's really good and really specific advice. Like, I love that. <laughs> that's, that's honestly what I did. Just like every time I reviewed a practice test, I it, it was annoying because it took a lot of time. But I would just go even Googling definitions of yeah. the answer choices I didn't recognize. Yeah. So when you reviewed exams, you kind of reviewed everything, even the things that you got correct and just like made oh, yeah. sure that mm-hmm. you got it correct kind of for a reason and like knew mm-hmm. I yeah. will not be the first one to tell people this, but your practice tests are your friends. They will help you the most because you need to pinpoint exactly what the problem is because this test is so big. You can't just say, oh, I'll just review it all again because that'll take you another six months. So mm-hmm. you need to pinpoint this topic, this topic, this topic. Exactly. Yeah. And then you can troubleshoot from there, I guess. Mm-hmm. And that's what you did. You knew you needed chem phys help. And so then you reached out from there, Uh, (laughs) increased your score. So success story. Um, So moving on to cars, um, just because cars next, you also did well in that section. What what advice do you have for that section? You already kind of said pacing Mm -hmm. is different on this exam, but. Yeah, the pacing, what, again, I think cars is the one section that suffered a bit for the shortened test, just because maybe it's just because I got so used to the seven hour one, but in my opinion, the five-hour one, it's a bit more like, ah, the clock's running out. But mm. as far as cars goes, I would say there's really not much else to do but practice. Um, but you need to start, obviously, everyone will tell you this, you need a strategy. People who are like, oh, I'll just read the passage and wing it, you're not going to do well. Uh, there's a couple strategies out there. I think MCAT Mastery has some. There's like you can outline or highlight or um, there's one called like interviewing, I think. I use the outlining which was just picking main ideas and writing tiny little blurbs on the, you know, on the side of my notes to keep track of what the paragraph was talking about. And one of the biggest things that helped me with cars is after I read the passage, I would take like five seconds, you know, and just reiterate, okay, what is the author saying? What are, what are his opinions? What is the point of the essay and what is trying to trip me up? Because the sneaky thing the MCAT will do is they'll have the author talking about his opinion or her opinion, 
And then all of a sudden they'll say, oh, and this other group of people has this opinion, but they won't make that clear at all. And so you will get confused and think, oh, well, this is also his opinion. And you have to like, that's why the tiny moment after you read it, the five seconds need to be, okay, this is his opinion. This is their opinion. I need to make sure I have that because questions yeah. will target that because they're mean. Yeah, they're trying to get you to really think about not only the passage, but maybe like the context of it mm -hmm. in its entirety, which is mm -hmm. difficult <laughs> with just the passage there. So that's good advice. It's kind of silly, but it was helpful for me to like put my head in the head of the author. Mm -hmm. Like if they were saying words like, you know, negative sounding words, I'd be like, yeah, like I hate that too. And like kind of like <laughs> get on their bandwagon and it'll help you catch their opinion more. Because it mm -hmm. could be something so subtle as like, this shined a negative light on blank. And that means that he does not approve of this. So if you just like kind of be his little hype man and be like, yeah, negative light. Yeah. <laughs> that kind of helped me <laughs> in a weird then, way. When you get to the question that's like, what would the author say in response to this? Well, you're mm -hmm. like, I basically know because I've been from yeah. the perspective this whole time. So that's smart. <laughs> yeah, just be, be the author's little hype man. <laughs> And that's not only smart, but interesting, you know, you can keep yourself kind of <laughs> exactly <laughs> in the exam. Yeah. So moving on to B&B, &B, uh, bio, bio, and chem and phys. So those kind of, you had challenges there. Um, what do you think was your challenge in the bio section? And like, how did you overcome that? Bio, bio is like, Honestly, my one thing that I would have definitely done differently, like I'm not about to retake this test, but it, you know, if I was going to, I would definitely try to brush up on my strategy. I'm not that confident on what I did for that one. I think the main issue with that there was my bio bio score stayed consistent and it was higher than chem phys. So I was like, okay, chem phys needs my full attention. Mm -hmm. I don't need to worry about this other stuff. I mean, obviously like I studied low key for psych and cars because I wanted to stay strong on it. Mm -hmm. But bio, you know, I tried to hit it as hard as I could, but I couldn't waste the time that I could spend to chem phys. So I think my biggest regret there is that I started to neglect it a little bit because each time I did my chem and phys studying, I'd be like, this is more important. So I guess some advice would be even if you feel like, you know, you, one section's really bad. You can't neglect another section. You really need to stick with it. And for bio, bio, what I did study, because I did study a lot for it. I mean, that's not to say that I just completely mm -hmm. abandoned it. I mean, my schedule when I was doing my hardcore studying was like three days chem phys, two days bio, bio, and then like, what is that? Five, six, seven, and then one for cars, one for psych. So it was like a lot like that. But what I did do for bio, bio was it's really helpful to kind of connect things. Like if you read about the urinary system and then you read about the, you know, respiratory system, like kind of make connections there, like see how does this feed into that and you'll start to piece together how it all kind of ties into the same thing. And then when you're reading about it on test day, they'll try to say, oh, this person has this, how will that affect this unrelated body system? But you'll be like, no, it's not unrelated because I thought about this already. <laughs> Yeah, if that makes sense. No, yeah, definitely applying it to, like, everything else. Mm -hmm. On all the sections, that's, like, a huge thing is, like, trying to connect everything, so. Mm -hmm. Also, spend a lot of time on um, the cell reproduction because that was something that came up so often. I mean, I cannot believe how often cell reproduction came up on my practice tests. I don't know why, but, yeah, yeah that's, that's high-yield like stuff. I was about to say high yield. Mm -hmm. <laughs> did you focus mostly on like high yield content you think and then or did you try and learn it all? I so I tried to go through the bio books like once a uh, once through clearly so I just saw it all yeah but then I did go back and like pinpoint the stuff that didn't come very easily like um, for some reason me and the digestive system are buds. I always understood the digestive system. I got most, almost all questions regarding it correct. So I was like, okay, I'm like, just going to ignore it then. Like, I'm not going to study it because I'm consistently doing well. Yeah. And sometimes you don't know why, but like, you know, if I'm getting one out of 10 urinary system and nine out of 10 digestive consistently, I'm going to go study the urinary system, you know, mm -hmm. like you, you need to triage for sure. 
Yeah. So not only the high yield content, but maybe the content that you're struggling with, definitely getting that mm-hmm. under wraps too. Because even, you know, studying the high yield stuff is super important. But if there is a whole passage on a topic you've never seen, then you're out of luck and you can't let that happen. Yeah, definitely. Well, I guess the last thing to talk about, I guess, do you want to talk about your test day and like what happened on that day? Um, How did you feel? And then the day that you got your score back, like the whole story with that. Sure. So my test day... That was probably the worst night's sleep I've had <laughs> in my entire <laughs> life. Like I woke up from nightmares. I had sweats. Oh it my it gosh. was awful. It was terrible. So I would like everyone to know that if you are panicking because you did not sleep the night before your test, it's fine. <laughs> it's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. I woke up. Well, I woke up. I woke up like three hours before and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm awake and I can't go to sleep. This is terrible. It's fine. You're honestly probably so hyped up on stress. You're not tired. You're going to be fine. (laughs) You're totally awake anyway. And the day of the test, honestly, okay, this is a little silly, but I wore the exact same clothes that I wore for every practice test, which since I took them at 630 in the morning was pajamas and I didn't Mm -hmm. care. So I wore pajamas to the testing site. You know, don't change anything. Eat the exact same food do your exact same routine. Like if you practiced or yeah, when you were doing your practice tests and you drove, like, you know, do the same driving music or whatever you're going to do, just really keep it consistent. And I got to tell you, it was so nice to think after this, I won't have to think about it for two weeks that like, you'll, you'll get an odd sense of calm. Like you will be oddly like, this is it. And I'm fine with this because I'm ready for it to be over. Yeah. So look forward to that, at least. And then getting my score, I didn't think about it for the first week. And then the second week hit, and it started to get like, it's like a bug in your head that just is like eating away slowly. I was fine. I mean, I, I handled it until the last day, like the day my scores were going to come out. They're like, it could, it could come out anytime between noon and five. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to make that. And it was. I would just say distract yourself. I watched like a whole season of a TV show between every episode, refreshing the score page to see oh if gosh. it was updated yet. Just know you're going to freak out, but just try to distract yourself and, and be proud that you honestly finished because good Lord, it, it's been an uphill struggle for months and you deserve a break. Yeah. And I just want to say, like, you said that your score goal was a 512 when you started and you had to compromise, but you basically got that. Like, you got your 511, (laughs) so that had to be a happy moment. It's funny, my family actually took bets on what my score would be. (laughs) Oh, no. And I was like, it's probably going to be, like, a 507, you know, I know it, and they're like, no. And my mom actually was like, I bet you made a 511. (laughs) And it was so funny, because I will never live that down for the rest of my life. Um. (laughs) (laughs) That your mom guessed it correctly. I know. (laughs) She knew. She had the gut feeling. I know. She spoke it into existence. (laughs) Exactly. That's the reason. No, I'm just kidding. Um, You got it because of hard work. (laughs) Right. Um, Well, anyway, it was a huge surprise and it was actually like higher than even my highest practice. So that's another thing. Like go in with high hopes. It's going to, it'll all work out. It'll be okay. Yeah. And now you're done. How does it feel to just be here and now you're applying to med school? Like, I got to tell you, like, I may sound super, you know, chill and like, oh, you know, this is what I learned, but thinking back on it it's it was such a dark place like anxiety wise and Mm -hmm. I'm just really glad to just be done with it um and if anything I help I think it helped me to learn how to deal with this kind of big pressure better because you know there's going to be big tests in the future I'm going to have big tests in medical school and so I think that this taught me you know when things get bad like you know meditate when you're not seeing progress try to switch up your studying tactics so As terrible as the MCAT is, it does teach you some things that are valuable. Yeah, I love that. Even not only academically, but like personally about yourself. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah. It's a journey and you're done. So congrats on your score. Is there anything else you want to say to students who are potentially going through it right now? Um, I would say, you know, 
My last piece of advice, don't read the stuff online or talk to your friends who are super negative. I read stuff online that was like, I made this score on practice tests and this score on the real one. And like, it was much lower and stuff like, oh my gosh, I'm not getting into my dream school and stuff like that. And it, it just made it 10 times worse. It's like gasoline on your fire. Don't do that. Like, listen, read the MCAT mastery emails, stay with positive people. O like only read the positive stuff because the negative stuff, it's out there and it's brutal. And you might think, oh, well, I want to see what's realistic. And it's not even realistic because those people are just commiserating and they're all just sharing their horrible stories. And the truth is that's not like realistic either. So stay away from that. Stay positive. You're already going through enough. Definitely stick to the positive stories. Yeah, definitely. We, we believe in that too. And we just want everyone to know that you can do it. Like, you don't yeah. need to be, misery loves company and you don't need to be in that company. Like, exactly. you can do it. Thanks so much, Renata, like, for sharing your story and walking us through everything you did. This was super fun that we got to catch up. Good luck with all of the med school stuff you're doing right now. We wish you the best and yeah, just congratulations. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate you guys. You've been so helpful. And I hope that, you know, all the MCAT takers out there just stay positive, stay confident. You're fine. You're going to do great. Hey guys, this is Monica again. And before you go, I just want to remind you to sign up for our free MCAT mastery strategy emails if you haven't done so already. So with those emails, we'll basically just send you tips and advice along with other success stories like Renata's so that you can hopefully gain inspiration while you're studying in addition to some practical tips for how to move forward with your study process. And you can sign up for those at mcatmastery.net slash free course. In addition to that, if you're feeling really stuck and really unsure of how to increase your score, or you're feeling super low in confidence, or you really just want someone to walk you through the exam and figure out what your personal struggles with it are, then you can do exactly what Renata did and sign up for tutoring with one of our MCAT mentors. Many of us have struggled with the exam ourselves, so we just want to give you the advice that we'd gotten when we went through it. And so to sign up for sessions with us, you can do that at mcatmastery.net slash mentors. And lastly, thanks so much guys for listening. Don't forget to give yourself breaks, practice self-care, and remember the most important thing, you really can do this. Thanks guys.